Economics at Baylor University. Um, just a little quick introduction uh, about me. My name is Dave Bridge. I'm a professor of political science at Baylor. I've been there for about 10 years. Um, my research is on the U.S. Supreme Court and specifically how the court deals with other uh, institutions, so how the court relates to Congress and the president, and even more focused, uh, I study how the Supreme Court affects party coalitions. So how does what the court does affect the Democratic Party, the Republican Party? How does Republican Party actions, Democratic Party actions affect the Supreme Court? Um, I teach, my main teaching responsibility is a class on the U.S. Constitution. Uh, this is a class that's required of every single student at Baylor. Uh, it counts for your political science major, but even if you don't major in political science, it's still required of you to take at Baylor University. I also teach a couple other classes. One of them is campaigns and elections. So that's offered every two years in the fall when there is either a congressional election or a presidential election. So there's one going to be offered next fall. And then I also teach another class called politics, games, and strategy, which uses games and simulations to, to model different aspects of politics and political science. I want to give you a little bit of an overview before I jump into some more uh, technical stuff. So this is kind of the recruitment phase of the video. Um, just a little bit about Baylor in case this happens to be your first exposure or the first time anybody's really talked to you about the university. It's a mid-sized university, so about 16, 17,000 students. So not a small liberal arts school, but not a big time state school as well. It is large enough to have a lot of the big time college stuff. So for example, um, like the sports. Uh, we have great football team, great basketball programs. Um, the arts are great at Baylor, so the music programs, the theater programs that students can go to. You get all the amenities, as it were, uh, of a big-time university. At the same time, we have our roots in small liberal arts, and so there's a commitment to teaching at Baylor. Um, typically, that means smaller class sizes, Every now and then you'll have a large class size for the really super popular classes, but really for a lot of our courses, we try to cap the, the enrollment at, at 29, if not 19. Um, this is all to say the midsize, the midsize uh, nature of Baylor is really great for political science students because the class sizes are small typically, but also we're big enough that we draw in some really great speakers to the university. So just a, a quick uh, sampling of who's come since I've been there. We've had uh, former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, former uh, current Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Um, so Supreme Court justices, they don't really make a lot of speeches uh, in public. And we've had two justices in my short time at Baylor. We've had a law professor from Yale, Akhil Mar, who's one of the best legal minds in the country. Very recently, we had a dialogue between Cornell West and Robbie George, so one liberal, one conservative, and they talked about how to have civil dialogue with people whom you, you disagree with. Uh, it was fantastic. So we're able to draw in a lot of speakers that have um, political orientations and something to say about politics or political science. Uh, if I could say something about our students, these are the kindest and warmest students that I have ever taught anywhere. And maybe that comes from being a Christian university. I don't know. Maybe maybe it doesn't. Maybe it comes from somewhere else. But wherever it comes from, they genuinely care about each other. They genuinely care about ideas and discussion. They listen. Um, we talk about hard stuff in our classes. I don't like to say that we have debates. We don't. We have discussions. And people disagree. And they have conviction behind what they say. So sometimes they say things like, I want you to know I, I think you're wrong, but then they also follow it up typically with, but I want to hear you out. Our students have a tremendous amount of empathy, and I think that that really helps with the political science education. In terms of our major, uh, the major requirements are pretty simple. It's 11 classes, so five introductory courses, an intro to American politics, the Constitution, political theory, international relations, and comparative politics. And that constitution class, again, counts towards your general education requirements. So 11 classes, five introductory classes, the other six courses are in whatever you want them to be in. So we want you to take the introductory classes, but then we want you to find your passion and take classes in that. So I'm an Americanist, a city of American politics. If I were doing this major, I would take those five introductory classes 
And then the other six courses for me would all be in American politics. So I would take things like the legislative process, the American presidency, campaigns and elections, public policy, voting behavior, and American political thought. And that's just some of the sampling that we have in American politics. For our students, typically after they graduate, they do one of four things. They're not limited to these four things, but these tend to be the things that I've seen most commonly from our students after graduation. Uh, many of them go on to law school. So I would say somewhere between mm, a third and half of all of our students go to law school. I've had fantastic students get into great top 20, top eight law programs. Um, I've had students get full scholarships to top law programs after Baylor. All this is to say you can come to Baylor and get into any law school. Um, some of our students go on to teach and typically the students who do this double major. So this is where I would pitch double majoring. If you're going to major in political science, I would really encourage you to think of something else in addition to political science and double major in that. And that's because of two things. One, we design our major to help you do that. So for example, that constitution class, double dipping in your general education requirements and the major, that frees up a, a spot in your schedule to use on something else. Also starting next year, our department will allow one class outside of political science in a related field to count toward your political science requirements. So if you take a class, say in history, um, as long as it's an upper level class, that will also count toward your political science requirements. So if you were to minor, for example, in history and major in political science, you could have that one class again, double dip, just opening up opportunities. And students who go on to teach typically have double majors to make them more versatile in the teaching field. So political science and English, political science and history. I've seen political science and math, for example. Our students also go on to do things in the business world. Um, so I have had a lot of students who work in journalism. Um, I've had students who do data analytics, for example, for uh, an accounting firm. They get hired by accounting firms to do data analytics for them. And that really stems from their background in political science and some of the, the skills that they build in political science classes. And the last thing our students do, so there's law school teaching the business world, and the last thing they do is they go on to work in politics. So I've had former students who now work for lobby groups in Washington, D.C. I have students who work in think tanks who are on political staffs. Um, and really when it comes to working in politics and even in some of these other career paths, internships are key because internships lead to jobs. And our program offers a variety of internships. So there's internships at the local level, so within the Waco community. Uh, for example, I have a student who interned for city government in one of the suburbs outside Waco, and now he works for that city. Um, in the city manager's office. We have students who go to Washington, D.C., and here there's two programs. So there's one during the semester, the Baylor and Washington semester program, and then the, the summer program. I recently had a student actually who studied in Baylor and Washington during the semester. She made such great connections. She decided to graduate a semester early, and she was hired as a, a senior level um, operator on the Trump re-election campaign. And whether you're for Trump, against Trump, that, that's beyond the point. The point is a senior level hire in a presidential re-election campaign is a big deal. Um, and then also there's an internship program in Austin. So students work with state legislators. Um, I recently had a former student who did this. And while she was there, made connections with the state attorney general's office. And now she works for the state attorney general. Um, so these are just some of the things that our students go on to do, that they do within uh, the Baylor community during their time at BU and also what they do after. Um, if I could make my pitch as to why study political science, um, I would tell you that the first thing I would want you to know is in my department, we are much more interested in getting you to ask questions rather than give you what we think are the answers to the questions that we find important. So we're not a department that's trying to push a Democrat agenda or a Republican agenda or a liberal or conservative agenda. Instead, we teach about ideas and institutions. So what ideas work best in theory and in practice? What rules and structures and institutions can help us best design things to function more effectively and efficiently? What are the effects of those institutions? If, if you like knowing how things work and why and how that applies to politics, 
then this is a great department for you. Again, we're much less focused on Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives, and pushing an agenda, much more interested in instilling a base of knowledge and developing a, a set of marketable skills that you can use outside of Baylor. So these skills go beyond just learning about politics. I would argue critical thinking is the most important one. Um, it's also the most important thing that employers are looking for these days. But beyond that, things that you can put on your actual resume, like learning how to use statistical applications and understanding how to negate unanticipated consequences. That's really important right now, for example. Things that go beyond political science and that make one versatile in a variety of career paths. That's what we do in our department. <clears throat> Okay, so there was the hard sell for, uh, for what we do as a department. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of a sample of what one of my lectures in class looks like. So this is a lecture that I teach. It's a very, very condensed version of this lecture that I give on presidential leadership and context. And it tries to combine political science theory with real world current events and practical application beyond politics. Um, so, for example, the theory that we learn in this lecture can be used for other things. I've had students come back to me and say that the, the stuff that they learned here, they were able to use, for example, in their fraternities and sororities to get the policies they wanted passed within the governing body of those fraternities and sororities. So it's practical beyond just politics as well. Um, I should say that this lecture comes from my introductory constitution class. Uh, it's kind of the capstone of my section on elected institutions. So I have a bunch of other lectures that go through these topics, uh, congressional obstacles, so, so things that get in the way from Congress getting stuff done. We talk about the constitutional powers of the president, so things found in the Constitution that allow the president to do things like, like veto bills. We talk about extra constitutional powers of the president, so for example, executive orders. We talk about how presidents are elected, um, the, the pluses and minuses of that, and then how the, the way elections are run affect the way that presidents can govern, because the two are tied together. Then we also talk about political parties and the coalitional nature, uh, the factional nature of American political parties and how that affects US presidents as well. So all of this kind of builds up to the lecture that I'm going to be talking about now, but there's a lot of buildup and all of these um, these topics in and of themselves are really interesting. These are some of my favorite lectures to give, but this one, the capstone, is, is really fun. Um, and it, I like to start this lecture with the idea that, that presidents can't shatter the ways of the old and build the ways of the new instantly. The goal of all of this is to show the obstacles and opportunities afforded to presidents. And it all comes down to this central message. They can't shatter the old, and they can't build new. Um, and these two videos here really say it all. I have said repeatedly that I intend to close Guantanamo, and I will follow through on it. Okay, so in 2008, uh, then-President Obama said he would close Guantanamo Bay. Um, let's see what happened by the end of his presidency. You know, one of the things you discover about being president is uh, that uh, there are all these rules and norms and laws. Okay, so he wanted to close Guantanamo, but there are all these rules and norms and laws. And um, in eight years in the White House, Obama never closed Guantanamo Bay. They reduced the number of prisoners, but it never closed. And he kept promising to do it, but he was unable to do that. All right, so here's the starting point of our election. Presidents can't shatter the old like Obama. He couldn't just shatter Guantanamo Bay. And he couldn't just build something new. He had to use what was in place already. So how can presidents create change then? Um, I don't want to oversell the difficulty presidents face. To be sure, they can create change in the political system. But my argument is that it's not just as simple as announcing a new policy and then hoping Congress will follow through on it. It goes much deeper than trying to coordinate with congressional leaders um, to legislate their preferences. I argue presidents have to identify the context within which their policy changes operate. So what I'm talking about is figuring out where presidents lie along two dimensions. So these two dimensions, these two contexts, are change agents discretion and status quo defenders. 
So we're looking at things from the point of view of the president. So let's consider presidents as the change agents. Presidents want to change things in the political system, and they're meeting up against those who don't, those who want to defend the status quo against the change agent, against the president. Okay, so let's look at this first one, change agent's discretion. Um, all institutions have rules, as Obama said. Uh, these rules range from loosely structuring to rigidly determining actors' behavior within those institutions. So essentially, the wording, scope, reasoning behind any series of rules varies from institution to institution, and, and that wording and scope and reasoning, it helps sculpt the range of choices available. So put very simply, the law matters, and it opens up or closes off possible courses of action. And when it closes off possible courses of action, then change agents have low discretion. But when the wording of a law is really nebulous and it gives actors free reign, then that gives change agents um, high discretion. So that's the first dimension. Change agents' discretion, is it high or low? The second is, are the status quo defenders weak or strong? So change agents, presidents, they're always going to run up against some level of resistance from people who want to defend the ways of the old. And these defenders can be, they can be constitutional. So they can be, for example, um, the opposite party in the House of Representatives and the Senate, or it can be the Supreme Court. And these are institutions that are named directly in the Constitution. Or they can be outside the bounds of the Constitution. So for example, lobby groups. Um, you know, the Constitution doesn't lay out lobby groups, but they're a really powerful force in American politics. So they can be constitutional or outside the bounds of the Constitutional, and then they can be strong or weak. So it really depends on the policy. Each policy has a different constellation of uh, institutional decision makers and uh, the decision makers for, let's say, abortion policy are different from the decision makers and the veto players, um, the lobby groups from, let's say, policy on firearms. Okay, so presidents have to identify their context. Do they have high discretion or low discretion? And are the defenders of the status quo weak or strong? And they got to figure out where in that dimensional space this policy and their behavior lies. And so when we put all this together, um, we're met with four change strategies. And we can place them into a two-by-two two box. Um, and this table shows the dimensions and their context. So here we have status quo defenders. And they can be weak or strong. And then we also have change agents discretion, and that can be high or low. And each one of these creates one of four change strategies, and each strategy is different, and it requires different behavior from presidents. So let's start with displacement. Um, this strategy features change agents uh, that have low discretion and status quo defenders that are weak. So of all of the institutional change strategies, displacement is likely to produce the kind of quick, visible change that, that we want to associate with presidents. And that's because they have incentive to do away with an institution. So if the status quo defenders are weak and they can't defend uh, a certain institutions, but presidents have low discretion, so they can't use the institution to their own benefit, then just get rid of it. There's no reason to keep it around because it's probably doing things you don't want to do because the defenders like it, but they're weak to defend it. So displacement is just eliminating an institution. Uh, let's move to layering here. So similar to displacement, uh, layering shows change agents having low discretion. So again, they, they can't manipulate the rules to do what they want to do with that institution. They're kind of bound by the norms and the guidelines in place. Um, but in this case, status quo defenders are strong. So you can't just displace the institution you can when they're weak. Instead, you have to do something else. So in layering, what change agents can do is they can layer new rules on top of old rules or alongside of existing rules. And the new layers, they don't replace the old ones. Instead, they add to the procedures in a way that transform 
the operational capacities, the decision-making, and the mission of an institution. Uh, conversion is kind of the exact opposite of layering. So here we see change agents have high discretion and status quo defenders are weak. So whereas status quo defenders were weak in displacement, because change agents had low discretion, they just got rid of it. But with conversion, uh, what they can do is they can reconfigure the rules and the norms and the procedures. You don't have to get rid of the institution. Instead, you can take what exists, turn it around, and use it for your own benefit. You, you reconfigure all of that stuff uh, in a radically different form from those that used to be in place. And so by doing that, you can almost pull like a, like a political judo move. You can use the institution, and whereas it used to be used for this purpose, now it's used for a purpose that you want it to be used for. And finally, there's drift. Uh, this is probably the hardest one to understand. Um, so what can change agents do when they have high discretion but status quo defenders are strong? Um, the, the strategy here is to undermine the rules. Um, so we might think of this as like, like termites in the basement slowly eating away at something. Uh, so what presidents do is they exploit the rules and typically what they do when they're using drift is they show an apparent public willingness to cooperate with behind the scenes exploitation of rules and norms in an effort to undermine the institution. It's really, really subtle here. Drift is hard to measure. It's unseen to many until gradual shifts eventually revolutionize the operation or the output of an institution. And sometimes it's not even about meeting a policy challenge or a policy change head on. It's about setting in motion one thing that will eventually set in motion another thing that affects these policies. Okay, so um, who cares about any of this thing? And this is where I get to uh, in my, my lecture in the capstone in my constitution class, we build up to this moment and we, we do all these lectures on these things that are, are talked about here. So can we think of a president who is isolated? That means a president who came to office without winning the majority vote or, or maybe was a vice president who acceded to the White House upon the death of a president and who has trouble with party politics. Can we think of a president who relies on unilateral constitutional powers? So things like uh, threatening the veto Presidents who rely on extra constitutional powers like executive orders, um, came to office without a mandate, encountered a thick government, so other operation, operational actors who try to get in the way. A uh, president who made lofty promises, but once they get into office, find that they can't build and shatter, like Obama said. And therefore, a president who must employ these change strategies. And here's the reason we go through all of this. It's because Trump fits all of these really, really well. And so this political science theory gets into contemporary politics. And in fact, you can even look at Trump himself, some of the stuff that he has said, um, and you can find that it's, it's remarkable how well this theory predicts what's happened and how well Trump fits into it. So here's just a, a quick look at some of the stuff that Trump has experienced while in office. It's very similar to Obama here, showing that Democrats and Republican presidents alike meet these problems. And we will begin working on an impenetrable, physical, tall, powerful, beautiful southern border wall. Okay, so Trump makes a promise uh, that he's going to build a wall. And here's what he finds out once he becomes president. He runs into obstacles. We have to get rid of what's called the filibuster rule. Okay, so he runs into problems with the Senate and the filibuster. I actually can't believe that we're having to fight to protect the security in a court system to protect the security of our nation. I can't even believe it. And a lot of people agree with us. Believe. Me. And then he finds that the courts get in his way too. So, so poor Donald Trump here, what's he to do? There are all these actors that are getting in the way, these status quo defenders. Sometimes he has discretion, sometimes he doesn't. So it's really hard to get stuff done. Trump fits this 
this theory really well, as all presidents do. Okay, so how does this apply to Trump? Well, here's four examples. Here's Trump using each of these strategies in different policy areas and how he got stuff done. So using displacement. Um, once again, status quo defenders are weak. Change agents' discretion is low. So you just get rid of something. And that's what Trump did with the Paris Climate Accords. He just removed the U.S. from the Paris Climate, Climate Accords. Um, he couldn't change the way that uh, we dealt with climate change, for example. But what he could do is he could take us out of that international treaty by himself. And he did. And now it's gone. We're not part of it. Uh, I'm going to save layering here for last, I think. Uh, we could look at conversion. So here, again, status quo defenders are weak, but Trump has a lot of discretion here. So whereas he couldn't just rewrite the Paris Climate Accords, um, you know, telling other countries what their environmental policy would do, he, but he could displace the U.S. from it. Here, Trump can rewrite some of the policies and the rules. So a great example here is drone policy. Um, so Barack Obama used drones to find and kill terrorists on the campaign trail. Trump said he was going to do that even more. He was going to kill terrorists with drones, and he, he's done that. Um, Trump also said that he wanted to change the way that the U.S. government used drones. So Obama had this long procedure with multiple steps and regulations about when a drone could strike. Trump has eliminated some of that. Also, Obama gave the order for every single drone strike that was made under his administration, whereas Trump has delegated some of that authority to military leaders. So he's used the institution that's in place, drones, and he's changed it to serve his purposes and his policy preferences. Uh, drift, again, this is really hard to measure. And in this case, what we're looking at is Trump doing one thing to try to affect another thing. So Trump said that the federal government would not consider grants to science institutions that studied things that were dealing solely with climate change. He said he didn't want the government to be using that money. And so what you saw was less grants that were directed um, specifically at climate change. And so, in fact, the, the term climate change was used hundreds of times more in science grants under the Obama administration than under the Trump administration. So he's really affected the way that grant seeking has operated by announcing this one policy. Uh, the best example of Trump using these change strategies, the absolute best one, is layering. And this comes in the form of how Trump has fought against Obamacare. So on the campaign trail, he promised that he would repeal and replace Obamacare, and he got into office. And he tried to do that. He tried to follow through on that promise. He tried to repeal Obamacare and then replace it with something else. And it didn't pass in Congress. And he said, okay, okay, I'm going to try something else. Repeal and replace won't work. So instead, I'm just going to repeal all of Obamacare. I mean, he tried to do that, and that didn't work either. And so then he went to the third strategy, you can't repeal and replace, can't repeal. So now he's just going to repeal the individual mandate and only the individual mandate. The only the part of Obamacare that says you must have health insurance uh, because the Supreme Court says that's a tax on you. And so he wants to repeal the individual mandate of Obamacare. And he, he uses a very clever strategy to do this. Um, he adds an amendment to the Trump tax cut bill. So this is the tax cut bill that's giving Americans uh, tax cuts mostly across the board. And then there's a rider onto the bill that says, we're going to drop the individual mandate on Obamacare. And he layers it on top of this because really the hardship in repealing Obamacare had come from centrist Republicans like John McCain. Uh, there was a very famous vote in the Senate on the repeal of Obamacare. And McCain did this dramatic thumbs down thing where he voted against the repeal. But when Trump layered the repeal of the individual mandate on top of the tax cut bill, every Republican had to vote for it because really the one thing all Republicans agree on is tax cuts. So by layering the repeal of the individual mandate on top of tax cuts, Trump was able to repeal it. And in fact, it's a really clever strategy because it was the, the individual mandate that the U.S. Supreme Court used to uphold the constitutionality 
of Obamacare. A lot of people thought it would be a Commerce Clause decision, but really it was a tax law individual mandate decision. So if the individual mandate is now repealed and the case were to go to the Supreme Court, it would seem like the court doesn't have the numbers to vote to uphold Obamacare. And they might strike it down as unconstitutional. Well, they might not. I don't know. It's hard to predict what the Supreme Court will do. But that was part of Trump's strategy as well, is to set in motion the next move. So he's using these change strategies. So I like to close this lecture by, by telling my students, uh, is Donald Trump Unique. And, and look, in terms of personality, absolutely he's unique. Very different than many other presidents, maybe every other president that we've ever had. But in terms of the way that he operates and the way that he has to deal institutionally, maybe he's not that unique. Barack Obama had to do the same stuff. George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, Thomas Jefferson. All presidents have had to operate with layering, conversion, drift, and oh, what's the last one? Uh, displacement. There we go. All right. All presidents have had to do this. So is Trump unique? Yeah, in some ways. In other ways, that's kind of politics as usual. All right. So what? So how, what does this matter? Why do I, I lecture on this stuff? Why do you care as a recruit, possible recruit to Baylor? So I, I think it has policy making implications. Um, this idea that instant and grand change can be made, that's impossible. We've had it in this country before, so like the Emancipation Proclamation that freed the slaves. That's a good example of instant grand change, but even then, dealing with the, the fallout of freeing the slaves took decades, if not more than a century. Um, so these change strategies, this is how presidents affect public policy, especially today, but it goes beyond policy making. So here's the scholarly literature on these change strategies, just for what it's worth. Um, so there's this one uh, highly mathematical argument that says, well, if this change strategy happens, here's a way of modeling that. Uh, that same author wrote about how Reagan used them. There's somebody who wrote about how Jefferson used these change strategies to affect the federal courts. Um, I've written about Trump and some public law stuff. Uh, there is a, a scholar who wrote about how unilateral powers of the president can be deployed with these change strategies. And then there's this other article that I'm working on that deals with environmental stuff. So like the climate change, the Paris Accord, that stuff. Um, but the cool thing about all of these studies, um, and these are all the ones I know about that talk about change strategies and how presidents use them. And the thing about every single one of them is that they came from Baylor. There is no better place in the world right now to be thinking about how presidents can get stuff done in a practical manner. So these two articles were written by a, a colleague of mine in the Department of Political Science. The Jefferson uh, Changing the Courts Through Change Strategies was an honor thesis by a student of mine. I wrote this paper with a graduate student from Baylor. That graduate student wrote another paper about unilateral powers. And then right now I'm working with a, an undergraduate at Baylor and we're doing research together on a co-authored paper that talks about how Trump is using these in the environmental realm. We've already actually presented this paper at an academic conference and we're hoping to submit it for publication soon. So this is just to say there are cool things happening at Baylor. Um, there's ways to get involved that really touch on some of the most key elements of American politics, indeed all politics today. All right, so let me close with some final thoughts here. Um, just really quickly, uh, if you do come to Baylor, I'd love to see you in my fall 2020 class, Campaigns and Elections. Uh, it is a junior level class, but I've had freshmen take it before and they're fine. They do just as well as anybody else. It's, it's possible to do well in the class. You don't need any real major background to take the class other than maybe you've, you've taken some, a little bit of government or a little bit of civics before at some point. Um, but I would really encourage you to take this class of mine because if you're only at Baylor for four years, this is the only time, hopefully the only time, that you'll be there during a presidential campaign. And, and it might be fun to take campaigns and elections. Um, if you come to Baylor and you want a seat in that class, I guarantee you a seat. Even if the class is full, I will find a way to get you into that class. And lastly, if you have any questions, I'd love to hear from you. Please send me an email. Uh, even if it's just, I, you know, I, I saw your video, thanks for that, or I saw your video, and here's what, everything, all the reasons why you're wrong. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, any questions, any comments you have, 
that'd be great. I hope you consider Baylor. I know this is a really weird time, so if you have questions about some of that stuff as well, I'll do my best to uncover them. Um, but I, I love recruitment. I'm sorry I can't meet you in person. I hope this suffices in some way. So good luck with your decision, and um, succumb bearish.